All right. Moving on to the second segment of tonight's class, and we're going to be learning also about Eliezer from Rabbi Leib Heyman. Um, a fascinating piece that he shares with us this week. So what he wants to do this week is he wants to share with us two important principles of education that we actually learned from Abraham. So the, the first one I, I've never paid attention to. It's, it's beautiful, beautiful. The second one, I actually heard something similar from Rabbi Mansour a couple years ago, but, but, but Rabbi Leib clarifies it so beautifully with proofs and, and just a fascinating concept. So we're going to really, really appreciate from these two. And these two um, great educational tips and principles, um, in my opinion, are not only for a teacher figure, and not only for a parent figure, it's for both. It's whether you're a teacher or whether you're a parent, anyone you are trying to impart a, a message, a, a tip for education, these two principles are fundamentals, absolute fundamentals. And I think it's it's beautiful that we're gonna be able to, to share them in this forum and hopefully uh, benefit and enjoy from them tremendously. So the first educational tip that the that the Reb Leib shares with us is based on dissecting the dialogue that the Torah shares with us that takes place between Abraham and his faithful servant, Eliezer. Remember, Eliezer and Abraham was more than just a master-slave relationship. It was also a teacher-student relationship, as we, as we mentioned previously. And Rebleib starts off, and then he proves this, he, he starts off by saying that there is a, an obligation upon an educator to obviously teach and instruct their student, but to also sharpen their student's intellect. Now, having said that, if we look at the Torah, there are three conditions, and I'm going to pull it up in a moment, there are three conditions that Abraham gives, instructs his, his servant Eliezer to comply with in going and seeking out this new matriarch, a wife for Yitzhak. The first is that the woman shall not be a woman that comes from the Canaanite nations, meaning the land of Israel where they are right now. Number two is, rather, he's got to go back to Abraham's birthplace to seek out a wife. And the third is that Isaac may not leave the land of Israel in order to go and find this wife. Okay, these are the three conditions. Not from Canaan, she's got to be from his homeland, and Abraham cannot leave. Take a look at the verses, and then I'm going to share with you Reb Leib's question. So here's the first condition. The first condition is that he makes him swear. Make sure that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanite in whose midst I dwell. That's the first. Second, rather you shall go to my land, to my birthplace, and that's where you shall find a wife for my son. Skipping one verse, you'll see why. Abraham says, no, he says, Pen tashivet binishama, make sure you will not take my son back there. He cannot leave the land of Israel. Rather, the Lord God of the heavens, who took me from my father's house and from the, and from the land of my birth, and who spoke, who spoke about me, who swore to me, saying, to your seed I will give this land. He will send his angel before you. Basically, Abraham's telling him, you will be blessed, Eliezer, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Go by yourself. And if for whatever reason, this woman's not going to want to follow you, too bad. You're not allowed. You have now to take an oath that only my only do not return my son back there. By no way is my son allowed to go back there. Listen to Rebleib's question. His question is that between, meaning after the first two conditions, before the third condition, the Torah tells us that the slave, the servant, Eliezer, interrupts Avraham. Look at it says, Vayomir elav ha'evet. So again, 
first condition cannot be from the women in this in this country second it's got to be a woman from my homeland now before the third look what the torah does in verse five the eved eliezer interrupts and he says perhaps the woman will not wish to go after me to this land Shall I return your son to the land from which you came? Meaning, can I bring him with me? And to which the third condition is brought out that no, you cannot send him back. It's got to be from this land. And by no way at all are you allowed to have my son leave this land. Okay. So asks Rebleib. I think it's a, it's a brilliant question. It's a question that definitely needs clarification. What, how is it possible that Avraham does not present all three conditions to his slave? How is it that he says two and then stops? And then, oh, the, by the way, there's a third condition. Did Avraham not prepare beforehand what he was going to mandate as a task for his slave? Okay, so then we can't say he says that he he didn't plan it. He must have planned it. And rather, we have to say that Eliezer was rude and he interrupted Abraham. Could that be? He wants to know either way. Rebleib wants to know either way. How is it possible that from the beginning, Abraham did not say this? And if he did plan on saying it, how is it possible that Eliezer interrupted? And even though he interrupted... Is it so important that the Torah has to record Eliezer's line, his question? Right, We all know that every single word in our Torah is important. A whole verse is added in our Torah with the interruption of the slave to Abraham's request. Why? Sir Ableib says there must be a reason. It's not by chance. There must be a clear lesson that is being learned from the fact that not only did the slave interrupt, but that the Torah records it. Take a look at this. Second, I just let someone in. Okay. Let's go back, Rebleib says, and understand who Eliezer was. Eliezer, the Torah refers to him as Damesek Eliezer, which is an interesting terminology. Damesek, Rashi tells us, this is in chapter 15, verse 2, based on the Talmud, Masechet Yoma, page 28b, that the word Damesek Eliezer is an, Damesek is an interesting word, and it really refers to him, Eliezer, drawing deeply from the well of Avraham and giving to drink from his master's Torah to the rest of the slaves and to the rest of the people that they were teaching. This is what the Talmud says about Eliezer. Eliezer, the expression Reb Leib says, the expression of doleu mashke is a very interesting one. Doleu mashke literally means to fill up. The way you fill up from a well is you bend over and, and you allow the, the bucket to dip down deep, pick it up and then pull it back up. And therefore, Reb Leib says this was exactly the way that Eliezer was in regards to toiling to understand his master's Torah. All of the ideologies and the philosophies, the, the new doctrines that was new to the world back then, he would deep dig deeply and delve deeply into understanding it. He proves this from the fact that the, the Talmud could have said that he just gave to drink that he drank from, from Abraham and he gave, shared it with others. From the fact that the, Torah, that the Talmud goes on to say that, that we learn from the Torah that he delved deep, very deep in order to draw it as it, it was coming from a well, we see that Eliezer was, was extremely committed to Abraham and to learning from him and dissecting and trying to comprehend every last piece of Torah that he was being taught. So now... Rebbe says, we know that there's no statement in our sages that does not have a source from our Torah. So where is it that, Rebbe says, where is it that 
our sages found to praise Eliezer in this way that he troubled himself to draw forth the Torah from Abraham. Sir Blaib says it seems to be that from our above question is where they learned it. From the question we said of how is it possible that after two conditions were given to him, was Eliezer able to interrupt his master? The Mishnah in Masechet Avot tells us that there are seven things which um, attest to a person's wisdom, attest to a person being wise. And there are seven other things that prove their stupidity or their lack of wisdom. One of them, and I'm reading over here, is when a person does not interrupt their fellow. That is the sign of wisdom, of, of wisdom. By the way, that also includes one spouse. I see you guys laughing over there. <laughs> That's a wise person. A wise person allows their fellow to finish their thought, to finish what, finish what they're saying, and wait to be, to, to, to their turn to, to speak. Now, if that is true by a husband and wife, by friends, by family members, by coworkers, from an employee to an employer, all the more so from a slave to his master, I'm saying there are certain times in world history when a slave would speak out of turn, bye-bye slave, execution, electric chair, however you want to call it. So how is it possible, says Reb Leib, that Eliezer allowed himself to interrupt his master in the middle of him receiving his mandate, which was a serious one, serious enough for the Torah to record it, so, explains Rev Leib that Avraham did so on purpose. Avraham actually gave his first two conditions and stopped. He stopped allowing Eliezer to ponder and to try to understand what is being asked of him, giving him the leeway and the opening to pose a question based on his intellectual capability, Abraham understood that Eliezer would come up with the following question. Well, why don't I just bring your son if there may be an issue? To which Abraham then continues and adds on to it. This was a very specific and deliberate method of education that Abraham was using. He understood the level of his student and he was allowing him the possibility to add his own contribution to this piece of learning. Again, sometimes teachers just come and they lay everything out. There is that form of teaching, but the greatest way of education explains or believe that we learn from Avraham in this instance is one of allowing room for your student to pose a logical question, which may lead them to just the question or possibly even the answer. And that adds tremendously towards the growth of that very student. How does it add? It also adds for the person to not only contribute to it, but be drawn towards it, but also remember it much better. Reb Leib says that when a, when a teacher involves the student in the process of learning and not just prepares them with a perfect picture at the, at the, at afterwards, they are allowing them to be involved in the learning and that will help them remember it much greater. And he explains this is a classic educational principle that it is very, very helpful for a teacher and a parent as well to when teaching their child or their student, to allow them to exert their logic, to understand it greater, to not present everything as a open, perfect piece. On the contrary, allow them to exert themselves to try to understand it in a much greater way. Now, obviously a person has to know the, the intellectual capability of their child or of their student. 
You're not going to, 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 to expect them to ask something way above their level. But that's the greatness of a great teacher and a great parent. And that is allowing the opening for their child or for their student, posing something that's on level, not too easy and not too hard, on level just enough for them to grow from whatever you're trying to, to help them with. And this is where what, what Abraham was doing. Abraham posed, not posed, um, presented two conditions. And he knew there was a third. But he posed these two conditions and then he allowed Eliezer to come up with the question on his own to which Abraham would give an answer to. And that would make sure that Eliezer would remember very, very seriously everything that is being, that is being taught. So now one may ask, Rebleib says, well, where does Eliezer get this trait from of digging deep, of, 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 of dwelling deep to try to understand and, and, and dissect that which his teacher is teaching him? So this is obviously from his great master, Avraham. Avraham was one that did not let a stone unturned. He turned over every stone in order to find God. Every time he found a fire, every time he found the sun, the moon, he was constantly searching and dissecting, delving deep to find the Lord. So this was something that he learned from his master, from his master, Avraham. And he may, and, and, and now the logic, what was the logic Eliezer, what it's going to have? Well, there are three allowances that a person has to leave the land of Israel. Either to find a livelihood, to learn Torah, meaning if a livelihood would be easier found outside of Israel, you can leave Israel. If you can learn Torah better outside of Israel, you can leave Israel. If you can only find, or if it's in order to find your spouse, you're allowed to leave the land of Israel. So Eliezer rationed to himself, if she doesn't want to come with me, I could bring him with me to find her or to convince her. Abraham says, no, Isaac, my son Yitzhak is different. He's different than the rest. He's not like anyone else. He's not your run of the mill boy. He is an ola timima. He is a perfect offering in order for an animal or any creature to go on an on a, on a altar, on a mizbeach, to be served to God, they have to be perfect. Isaac had to fit a perfect criteria to go and be served on the altar, as we said in last week's parsha, he was. And therefore he, out of all of our patriarchs, was the only one who never stepped out of the land of Israel. His entire life was in the Holy Land. So this is the end of the first educational principle Rebbe shares with us. And again, it is to lead your students into logical conclusions and questions opposed to just posing everything to them and, and just giving them a perfect painting. Now comes the second one. And I think this one is equally as important, if not more important. So listen up. It's a beautiful concept. Concept is as follows. If we look at the past three Torah portions, that is Lech Lecha, Vayera, and this week's Torah portion, Chaye Sarah, we see many, many different conversations that the Torah recounts Abraham has with a lot of different people. Reb Leib goes and he counts them. He says, first of all, we see a long conversation, not a long conversation, full conversations that Abraham has with his wife, Sarah. We see conversations Abraham has with his nephew Lot, conversations with various kings, such as Paro, Malkitzedek, Avimelech, the king of Sidom. And then in this week's Torah portion, we see a conversation with Ephron and the children of Chet. And then this conversation that he has with his, with his servant, Eliezer. Many conversations. It seems like Abraham was a big talker. And that's what he needed. Right? He was talking to the people nonstop. That's how you bring people close. Not by being to yourself and being scared or being timid, introverted. No, Abraham was an extrovert par excellence. And that's what made him different than the previous generations, especially the one that we always try to compare him to, Noah. Noah was also a great believer, but Noah was an introvert. He did not go out and share the word of God and his revelations. Abraham did. So Abraham's a great talker, and the Torah recounts at least nine conversations Abraham has in the past three Torah portions, okay? There's one conversation, Reb Leib says, that seems to be missing. 
one specific conversation that we don't find the Torah tell us about. And what may that be? He explains, what was Abraham's goal in life? What was his purpose? His goal and his purpose was to bring the word of God to the world. Something which no one has ever done before. How was he doing that? By teaching and educating over and over and over to thousands upon thousands of human beings. And let me tell you something, he was successful, very successful at it. Now, having said that, there's one major conversation that we don't see in the Torah. Abraham was living for God. Abraham was living to spread the word of God. But what does every successful person look forward to? To finding their successor. Finding who is going to continue after them. Because they're not going to be around forever. Abraham knew based on the promise of God that his successor was going to be his son. And specifically his son Isaac. Reb Leib says, we don't see any conversation between Isaac and his father, between Abraham and Isaac. We don't see any educating being done from Abraham to his father. I'm saying the first patriarch's got to impart education and a message and a lesson onto the second generation of patriarch, Isaac. We don't see any of that in the Torah, asks Reb Leib. How can that be? How does that make any sense? Absolutely none. He says, you know what? There's one conversation that takes place in last week's Torah portion between Isaac and Abraham. And that is a total of 15 words regarding the Akedat Yitzchak, regarding Isaac being brought up on the altar. That's it. What about all the lesson planning? What about the educational discourses that he must have given his son, that he must have told him and taught him how to teach others and to pass on to his own children and grandchildren? Zilch, nada, nothing. Rebleib says, how could that be? How can that possibly be that the Torah recounts none of that? Now, you can't come and say, he says, that the Torah is being careful in its words and not wanting to overuse words. <laughs> we have nine other conversations the Torah tells us that Abraham has, which some of them are very important, some not, but none of them can be as important of patriarch number one, generation one, passing on and teaching to his son, patriarch generation number two, Isaac. So how do we understand this? So Reb Leib answers beautifully based on the Talmud in Masechet Brachot, page 7b. And I'll quote to you the Talmud in Hebrew, in English. It's a very easy, uh, very quick line. It says as follows, that serving the Torah is greater than learning it. What does that mean to serve the Torah? That means to serve those who study and who live Torah. It's greater to serve someone who embodies the concepts that the Torah has rather than learning the Torah itself. Well, why is that? Reb Leib says that this is a, one of the most, if not the most successful method of education. And it is based on the idea of personal example. Personal example teaches leaps and bounds beyond anything you can read in a book. Volumes upon volumes can be learnt and written from personal example way more than reading chapters and books about morality, about Torah, and about anything else. Real life example is worth so much more. And that's why a disciple and a student is encouraged 
to serve and to be around their master, their teacher, their Rebbe, because what they're going to learn from there is so much more than, so, than, than anything else. Do you know how many pages and pages a person has to go through in order to learn how to fulfill something, whether it's the laws of Shabbat, whether it's the laws of blessings, whether it's the laws of Kashrut, whether it's the laws of Tefillin, whatever it is. But if you would just spend one Shabbat with your rabbi, how much laws of Shabbat are you going to learn? If you would spend one morning service with your rabbi, seeing how he puts on his tefillin and how he prays, how much are you going to learn there? Way more than all the time and pages you can go and, and learn. It takes a lifetime to learn. Shimusha yoter milimuda, the Talmud says. Serving the Torah greater than learning it. Because by serving it, you are also learning it and you're learning it in the most practical way possible based on this concept your blade tells us a fascinating concept he says that abraham of course he taught his son and he sat him down and he lectured him and he taught him everything how to pass on the torah and all the prophecies that he received from god and finding god but that's not what defined Abraham as an educator. And that's not what helped Isaac really learn. That was just the information. Yes, the information and how to pass it on. Okay, you cannot replace the Talmud. You cannot replace these shelves of books with only, only serving Torah and being around Torah scholars. You still need to learn, but that's not the point. The point is, as Rebleib says, is the Torah is making a real, real point and teaching us a real lesson that if anyone wants to teach another individual, and especially if it comes from parent to child, it's by leading by proper example. And this is beyond being hypocritical. Of course, a hypocrite <laughs> of a parent is definitely not successful in their, in their children's eyes. That is an obvious. However, if a parent does, and does out of love and out of care, whatever it is that that parent fulfills, the, child, the children and the child will want to fulfill as well. And this is exactly what Abraham did. Rebleib says, how is it possible with one short conversation, the only conversation the Torah has between Abraham and Isaac, that Abraham was able to get his 37-year-old son on an altar to sacrifice himself? And he says it makes it so much harder. Was Isaac a believer? Yes. Did Isaac trust his father? Yes. But Abraham was now being asked by God and telling his son to do something which was contrary to to what he was being told this whole time. We spoke about this last week and even the previous week. Abraham is commanded by God to leave the pagan way of life, to leave an idolatrous way of life, the sacrificial way of life, which they would always sacrifice their children. Comes Abraham to his son and he says, my son, now we're going to sacrifice you. His son doesn't say, Isaac doesn't say, um, but dad, are you sure? Are you sure that your antennas were on straight when God told you this prophecy? Maybe the, your, your wires were, 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 were twisted? Let's put them back? No, nothing. Yes, father, right away. The Midrash actually tells us that, Ab that Isaac was such a believer and he, he didn't resist at all. He tells his father, daddy, tie me up. So this way, God forbid, my instincts don't overcome you and I try to maybe punch or kick back when you are slaughtering me. And he was tied up on the altar. Where did Isaac learn this from? How did he get this education? How was it possible that Abraham taught him this? There were no conversations. Says Reb Leib, of course Abraham was always teaching him and speaking to his son, just like we all have to speak to our children all the time and teach them verbally as well. But that's not what taught his son. What taught his son was his actions. His actions of devotion and commitment to the Almighty. 
that is what taught his son to do the same. And furthermore, Abraham would share his past stories with his son. Abraham was 100 years old when his son was born. He had 100 years of stories to share with his son of the time he finally found out that idols make no sense at all and he destroyed his father's idols and how he was saved from that miraculously and how he found God and how he survived the fiery furnace, how he put himself in the fiery furnace for the sake of God. Ah, that story of self-devotion, that's how Isaac came to the conclusion, I must do it myself as well because my father did it and my father was successful in it, so may I will be. Those stories that each and every one of us have of commitment and self-devotion and belief and trust in God, those are the stories of emunan bitachon we need to share with our children as well. That is how Abraham educated his son, and that's how we are supposed to educate our children. More than all the lessons and the lectures and the books and the speeches, that's important, but it's not the most important. It's not what's going to build your child. It's not what's going to change your child. It's not what's going to inspire your child. You are, Rebleib says. Your actions will, your past, your stories, your present, your future is going to be all dependent on how you are going to be an example for your children. So just as a recap for these two educational fundamentals the first is and this is true with your children and true with your students whenever you're teaching try to leave an opening for the person that you are teaching that is listening in for their own questions for their own conclusion not when i mean conclusion not conclusion like a false conclusion but their own logic to be applied to what you are saying we learn this from the fact that abraham paused when he was giving the conditions to his slave, Eliezer. And then we have to understand that leading by example is our choice. And this will be the choice which will define how great of a child, how committed of a child you will raise and have. And it will all be based on how authentic and genuine we are in that which we do. I want to share a story from Reb Leib. As we just shared, stories are, are, are always the most inspiring and the greatest way to teach any type of lesson. And this story, Reb Leib himself wrote in his Hebrew book, Chig Lev, and he writes it right after this Dvar Torah, and he says that he remembers a remarkable thing that happened to him one Yom Kippur when he was in the Lakewood Yeshiva. He says that this in the middle of the holy day of Yom Kippur, the Rosh Yeshiva, Rev. Aaron Leib Cutler, Come, came over to him and he summoned him and he said, come, I need to tell you something. Upon his immediate request, he, he went to the Rebbe. Of course, Rev, Rev Aaron Leib was everything. Or sorry, Rev Aaron Cutler was everything to Reb Leib. And he says that there's a certain boy in the yeshiva which is considering leaving the yeshiva now. And his family comes from Germany. They're putting a lot of pressure on him and they want him to follow in the German way, which was to send their boys to college. And he was being put a lot of pressure on by his parents to leave the yeshiva and go to university. And which we know, and which we know already that Rabbi Aaron Cutler and so is Rabbi Leib, very against, especially back in the day. So, he says, I want you to go over to the boy discreetly, speak to him heart to heart and convince him out of it. And maybe now on the day of Yom Kippur, he's already had an uplifting day, day of connection and prayer. It may be a good time for you to approach him. And so he did. And Reb Leib approached the boy, spoke to his heart, carried out the mission that his master, Reb Aaron Cutler, gave him. And he was successful. He was so successful that the boy that he went over to not only stayed in the shiva he became one of the greatest in all of lakewood and his own children and grandchildren are still torah god-fearing individuals obviously jews today all because rev iron went over to reb Leib and he told him to go carry out this message and he did so 
wasn't like he told him and he forced it upon him. He came and he said, I know you will be the one that will be able to accomplish this mission in the greatest way possible. And so he did. And this is an, an amazing thing when a, an educator, when a teacher is able to impart a mission upon their student, upon their disciple, and their disciple able to carry it out. It is something that every single educator and parent should strive for. What we try to do, and I want to just end off with one thing that I, that I, that I, another dimension that Rabbi, um, that Rabbi Mansour, when he shared a similar idea, he shared this as well. When we educate, what we are doing is we are not imposing upon our children, rather we are elevating ourselves. We're not here to change the child, we're here to change ourselves. And when we change ourselves, the child falls in place. And he asks a very important question. How come is it that the obligation of having children is twofold? It's peru or vu, be fruitful and multiply. Just be fruitful or, be mul or just multiply, why double? Why is the concept of doubling it over? And he answers it based on what we see in last week's Torah portion when the angel of God calls Abraham. He calls him Avraham, Avraham, twice. Why twice? This is a fascinating insight Rabbi Mansur says. What is the goal of a parent in education? And not only in education, rather in coming to this world, it's duplicating yourself. It's refining yourself and duplicating yourself by having children. How does a person duplicate themselves? By raising themselves and then having a child and having the child do as well and even outperform them. When the angel says, Rabbi Mansur came to Avraham and tells him, Avraham, Avraham, stop, don't sacrifice your son. You have fulfilled your mission. You have duplicated yourself. Abraham, Abraham, it's Abraham and then it's Isaac but we're going to call him Abraham right now because now you've duplicated yourself. That is our mission. Our mission is to duplicate ourselves into our children, but not by force. Sublime through our actions, through the way we speak, through the way, through the things we do, through the commitment and the love that we have for that, which we do. This is what we learn in this week's Torah portion. We learn to be great educators, to be great parents. And only if we care about it, will it really be successful. So a great blessing in the merit and the great honor of the Zer Shimshon and Rebleib is that we should always be attentive educators and parents, always allowing for the logic of the child to develop based on how we are educating them and by being the greatest example possible and leading by our actions more than our words. And uh, thank everyone for joining us. And at this point, anyone who has a question may unmute themselves. I have a question. Yes, Sarah. I have a okay, question. Birthday girl, Aviva has a question. Hi, uh -huh. hi yes, Sarah. So um, <laughs> Abraham was... Um, teaching all those thousands of people and they became Jewish, they converted. Yes. So what about Eliezer? He was Oh, he... very good. So a very good, good question. I know I knew someone was gonna ask it. So let me ask the <laughs> questions for everybody. And then I'm gonna and then I'm going to see I was trying to do what Abraham did to Eliezer. <laughs> exactly. You lead us that too. So look at this. The question is we said that Eliezer was not allowed to learn Torah because he was a slave. Well, because he was a Gentile. So how was Abraham teaching other people Torah? Oh, because he was converting them. So why didn't he convert Eliezer? So you have to understand, a slave owner has the choice to free his slave and then they can convert or not. Abraham chose to not free Eliezer as a slave. Rather, he kept him as his slave, as his property, because of the great value he brought to him as that faithful slave and servant. Wow. Good yes. question, Aviva. Great question. Unreal, unreal answer. Never thought of that even. Yeah. Wow. Okay, Thank Isaac you. is standing ready to ask a question. Go, Isaac. <laughs> I was going to say, usually very amazing, but 
to have had COVID a few days ago and, and to come back and uh, not a wink. I mean, this is, it's amazing. I mean, it's a, a tremendous uh, uh, act of endurance and love. <laughs> and that's all Thank I, you. I appreciate it. It's, the, it's not me. It's the merit of the Zer Shimshon and Reb Leib that I'm able to share it with you. I, as I speak, the palms of my hand in, and my feet are sweating. I'm not even joking. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still not 100%. So, Rabbi, Thank I'm not going to keep you long because I know you need to get your uh, sleep. Oh, sure, Ron, I'm sure. you got seven of Uncle Label's descendants on the video. Wow. I think left because I think she has a Tehillim class every Wednesday at nine. And you have nine if you count the little kids that are attached to the mommies. The mommies. Beautiful, beautiful. Shana Mendel. We have Giddle. I am Pam, Pam Friedman, and Rachel. Lynn. Lynn. Jordana. Right. Jordana. All right. Us. We're coming on strong. Awesome. Beautiful. 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 I'm so happy that we're able to all join in and, and share this together. Thank you. It's, it's beautiful work that's being um, taught. being taught by you. That um, it, it's just very beautiful. Really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Rabbi. My pleasure. Thank you. If we have any other questions on the Parsha, last chance. You have to go first. We have thousands. You have to go first. No, no, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. I'm good. That's why we did it half an hour earlier. Don't worry. Yeah. Don't be insulted as we all sign off. <laughs> <laughs> we need to rest. And we need yeah. to go forward and do and then learn. Exactly. Yeah.